Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Matt D. Wilson, writer of Imposter Syndicate, which is funding right now on zoop.gg, and also the host of the War Rocket Ajax podcast. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a multi-talented creative person. He has a podcast. He's a comic creator. He has probably a tuba player or something like that. I don't know for sure, but we'll ask him in the interview itself here too. But we're joined by creator of the Imposter Syndicate. And of course, I'll let you talk about your podcast as well. Matt D. Wilson, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Kurt? Doing good. Doing good. So what instrument do you play? None. I tried to learn to play bass guitar when I was a teenager, and my parents bought me a bass guitar with no frets, so it was harder to learn. <laughs> and I ended up giving up on playing a musical instrument. I took TV class instead of band in middle school. My wife is a classical guitarist, though, so she has all the musical talent in my household. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I am an author, humorist, podcaster, and comic book writer. I've been podcasting for going on 13 years now. That's probably the thing I've been doing the longest. I've also written a bunch of stuff. I've worn a lot of different hats over the years in different arenas we're on the same wavelength when it comes to podcasting and i have to ask you of course what is the name of your podcast i actually have a few the one people probably know best the comics and pop culture show is called war rocket ajax but i also host a very original podcast about making fun of movies called movie fighters and a episode by episode chucky podcast called friends till the end that's with erica henderson and bonito serino i've got a few that i do regularly well i, I can only deal with one so you know <laughs> I, I hats off to you on the podcasting side i believe what we're talking about today is imposter syndicate specifically yeah that's the project that's funding now on zoop.gg as of recording this it's got about a week left of funding time the idea is generally when a supervillain dies or retires or otherwise has to quit being a supervillain, who picks up the slack for them? Who puts the mask back on? Who puts on the costume? In this book, a shadowy organization is hiring actors to take over for supervillains who have to quit for whatever reason. The supervillains always come back, right? They never go away. The idea of this book is what if someone is behind the scenes pulling the strings, making sure that they come back to fight the superheroes another day. It's a common trope when it comes to obviously comics and you're taking a wonderful twist on it. I do love that. That's actually pretty amazing. It's just like, you know, how many jokers are there really? No, they're just <laughs> actors. They're they're paid by actor, you know, it works out well. Yeah. I mean, if someone has some kind of interest in making sure that superheroes and supervillains keep fighting, then they'll make sure there's a joker to show up. Yeah. and fight batman again that's the idea being a multi-talented person that you are do you find that either being a comic creator or a podcaster does it creatively drain you or does it energize you it does both it's a push and pull it's a yin and yang there are times when you fit or like it you know you kind of have that thought of why am i even doing <laughs> this and then you also have those moments of creative fulfillment and joy that come from doing things and they're not always the moments you suspect like i've hit those kind of low points right after something got published or i've done a big episode of a show and i've felt those higher more joyous moments at times when it's just like i'm in the middle of working on something like a creative breakthrough can be a moment of utter joy because you've cracked that one little bit 
of a story that you were missing. It's both at the same time. It's the emotion of life, you know, as long as you're doing it, you're going to have the ups and downs. What's a recent creative breakthrough, either through podcasting or writing, that you've gotten in a eureka moment for? Well, as I was writing Imposter Syndicate number two, which is part of the Zoop campaign is for issues one and two. As I was writing issue two, I had this idea for a character. The lead character's name is John. He becomes a supervillain named the Bonobo, who just wears an ape costume. He meets some other supervillains who are in training in the second issue. And I had this kind of breakthrough for one of the other supervillains in training because initially she just looks like a clown. Her whole gimmick is just she's a clown. She's sort of like a, a riff on Harley Quinn. And then I figured out what her actual powers are. That was a, like a, yeah, let's go with that kind of eureka moment. So that was a good one. Thinking up characters and building a world are time-consuming and stressful. It can be in some cases there. When you started this world, what was the spark that created the world of Imposter Syndicate? This is a book that's 20 years in the making. I had this idea in 2003 when I was 19. And I know it was 2003 because Marvel had introduced the Epic line again. That version of the Epic line from 2003 was essentially anybody can submit to Marvel an idea for a comic. And so I thought of an idea and I thought about that trope of like the supervillain always seems to die and then they come back. And I wanted to come up with an explanation for that. So I submitted originally as a Marvel comic with Marvel characters in it. Then when they rejected it, because I think they rejected basically every epic pitch, I reworked it into this world that it is, into this kind of broader idea. You could thank Marvel Comics for <laughs> me originally having this idea, but then over time it's really evolved into something much bigger. I'm working with a team, artist Rodrigo Vargas, and a colorist who we haven't named yet, but he's on board. There's an artist and a colorist who are working with me. When you have a collaborative effort and a creative team uh, behind an amazing comic like this, it's always wonderful to to get their names out there as well, too. Um, yeah. What was it about Rodrigo's art that spoke to you when you first saw it? Well, this is our second project together. Previously worked on a graphic novel that got published by Caliber Comics called Everything Will Be Okay. The idea was, what if every possible disaster happened at the same time? I had seen Rodrigo's art before we started working on that. He'd sent me samples and stuff. He actually started as a fan of War Rocket Ajax, and that's how he got in touch with me. The art that came back for Everything Will Be Okay blew me away. It, it's so dynamic and so just a, an energy to it that I couldn't even have imagined. And then we started working on Imposter Syndicate together and the superhero stuff, it just leaps off the page. It's so good and so funny. He's added in jokes that I didn't even put in the script, uh, but he understands that the tone of this is kind of like satirical and funny and he just absolutely nails it every time. I'm I'm blown away every time he sends in a page. It's so good. What was your favorite joke that you can actually tell us without spoiling it? It's in the preview pages that you can see on Zoop. So there's a character, a supervillain, who the lead character, John, sees outside of a window fighting a speedster superhero. And this character... His name is Dr. Didgeridoo, the villain character. He like wears crocodile Dundee style garb and he fights using a didgeridoo. And I never said anything in the script about him having a pet crocodile, but Rodrigo just gave him a crocodile <laughs> and the crocodile is so funny and is there in multiple panels. And every time it shows up, it makes me laugh. So the crocodile is the best joke. And it's all Rodrigo. When you were writing the script and Rodrigo gave you back artwork, what was a piece of artwork besides the crocodile, which is hilarious, by the way, I do have to admit, I that is that is now my favorite character I'm rooting for in the series, so you better not <laughs> kill him off. What was a piece of artwork that you got back? Rodrigo looked at your script. That was better than what you had written on the page. There is a final splash page in issue one, where John's first attempt at being a supervillain sort of comes to an end. And he's face to face with our Spider-Man analog superhero named Webshot. The way that Rodrigo 
stylized the way Webshot is different from Spider-Man and is kind of his own entity who does his own thing. The sort of just like aftermath, which is what that splash page is, is unbelievable. The page is finished, but we didn't make it one of the preview pages so as to not give it away because I want people to see it in the book. Uh, it's so good. Crowdfunding campaigns are like a second job usually for the most part. I mean, it could be a yeah. third depending on how many jobs you have. When it comes to this campaign here, and, and obviously you've done others in the past, what has Zoop given you from a creative standpoint or a crowdfunding standpoint that maybe eases your mind creatively? I mean, the big thing is... You talk about having a second or third job, running a crowdfunding campaign, you know, with other crowdfunding sites is four or five jobs by themselves. On Everything Will Be Okay, which we did on Kickstarter, I was writer, editor, shipping clerk, warehouse manager, because I had all the boxes of books in this room. I was customer service manager. I was doing all the marketing. It was everything. I was doing everything. And it was exhausting. And in the end, I feel like so many things could have been done so much better if it wasn't me doing them, because those are not my areas of expertise. I want to just do the creative part. And Zoop helped with that immensely. They've helped me with the kind of marketing and PR part of it by setting up interviews, sending out emails, you know, being more hands on on that side of things. They handle some of the back end shipping and printing stuff by virtue of taking that off my plate i really can focus more on the let's make this book the best we can let's you know really focus on the creative side of things and i can focus more on doing the marketing i want to do part of marketing i want to do which is talk to you and get people to spread the word around and kind of have fun with it instead of stress about it <laughs> which is always part of a crowdfunding campaign. You're about the fourth or fifth person I've had on more recently that has used Zoop as well too. And it's been consistent across the board when it comes to praising uh, Zoop as a crowdfunding site. So hopefully more yeah. people, creative people go to that. I would, I would recommend it. It's nice to just not have to worry about some things, even if they charge a little more for it, but it is worth it. That's, That's the long and short. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what's uh -huh. the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? The one that comes to mind, I have the wisest that pops into my head. And then the second wisest one that pops into my head was back when I was doing a lot of kind of written comedy essays in the mid 2000s. I was talking to an editor on one of those websites. He essentially said something to the effect of, you know, people say, make what you love your job and you'll never work a day in your life. Well, if you make your hobby your job, then it's not your hobby anymore. That's true. I have done that to degrees. Comics have kind of become a job and not a hobby, like reading comics, because we review comics on War Rocket Ajax. I've had other things in my life that I've kind of kept for just me. And I think that's always good. There's a real hustle culture today where people want to make everything into content. That advice was have something for yourself. And I would tell anybody that too, because once you cross that threshold, it's a job. So what do you have for yourself that, you know, you can kind of unwind with? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to tell anybody. It's like collecting and like my dad was really into coins. Nice. I ended up with some of his collection after he passed away. And so I've kind of kept those and been, and when I go somewhere where there are old coins, I look through them and see about buying any, but I'm never going to do a podcast about coin collecting. Of course not. <laughs> what challenges do creative people face today that needs to be addressed? I think it is harder and harder to do your own thing. In some ways, it's easier to do your own thing to a certain level. Because with crowdfunding, with the internet, with stuff out there, it is easier than ever to get your own ideas, your own characters, your own stuff in front of an audience. But it's really hard to get your stuff in front of a big, wide, broad audience. Because a lot of creative culture is made up of a very few franchises and huge, huge media companies. You can have a micro audience, but it's really, really hard to get 
a big, larger cultural audience for a new idea. And I don't have a solution for that, but I think it's harder to elbow your way in to kind of the bigger, broader cultural conversation than it used to be, I think. It's also one of those things where you get all of these content creators and all of these gurus saying, you know, well, you need to niche down to exactly what you want to promote and do. And yet it doesn't allow those like us that have multiple avenues of creativity to really share and showcase that style of content. Yeah. I have nothing against Marvel, obviously, and I have nothing against Star Wars. I have nothing against the, the big stuff. But if you really want to get to that level where like everybody's talking about your creation, because those things are so big, it's really, really hard to make a new thing into a thing that people care about. <laughs> you can have your small audience care, but it's it's really hard to make a lot, a lot of people care and to break through the noise. I would love to figure out a way to do that, but I'm not quite there yet. The only people that really care about our stuff other than our audience is ourselves. Yeah, right. And y you can believe in yourself a lot. And like even when I get as dejected as I ever do, I never think I'm going to quit because I can't. I'm yeah. going to just keep going. Even if I never reach that broader audience, I'm too motivated to keep making stuff. I was going to say I'm stubborn. But <laughs> mo motivated sounds better. I like that. I may, I may use that in future interviews. I, I think it's just, it's amazing because we, we have passion for this and we've had other words and we have, uh, I'm sure we've had friends and family say, why are you still doing this? Or why do you keep doing this? And it's just like, it's because I like doing it. I love it. It's fun. Keeping a bunch of plates spinning. It's giving up some social engagements, which I don't always mind because I don't always love social engagements. Yeah. There's a trade-off. I know what my brain always tells me, this is what you have to do. There might be things you want to do, but this is what you have to do. I'm going to keep following that even if it never leads me to any huge success. I'll take my small success and let that drive me. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I remember when I was in middle school, this shows how far back I was thinking about the stuff that Imposter Syndicate is ultimately about. When I was in middle school, like sixth grade, I was doing English class, write a story, come up with an, an original story, like a narrative and write it out. And I created this superhero character who was just me. His name was Matman, in fact. I tried to make it funny. It was like a superhero parody kind of story because I was really a big fan of The Tick, which was a big cartoon at the time. People wanted to read it. It was like a school assignment. I would like turn it in and I would tell people about it and they'd be like, I want to read that. And so I would share it with other people in class who would like read it and think it was funny. And I don't think they were laughing at me. There were other things I got laughed at for in middle school, but I don't think that was one of them. I think people actually found it amusing. That definitely made something click on for me as like, oh, that's a thing. Is there a comic that made you feel the way you hope readers of your work will feel after reading Imposter Syndicate? Hmm. The one that I can think of, it's funny and thoughtful, the thoughtful, but also you have sort of an emotional connection to the characters. But a pretty recent one is uh, One Star Squadron. Takes the idea of superheroes and takes a superhero gimmick and gets a funny concept out of it. But also, it's not totally just a goof. And that's the tone I'm kind of going for. I feel like that's true of anything Mark Russell does. And he's like a current writer who, if I could write like him, I would feel very, very fulfilled. I'll choose One Star Squadron. Never heard of that one yet, or if it's not come on my radar, but it looks like I'll have to. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think it was pretty short, so it should be easy to catch up on it. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My mom, I uh, had a lot of like English teachers and theater teachers and, and other sort of teachers in school who inspired me or, or encouraged me to do creative work. But the one person who continually encouraged me to do creative work throughout my childhood and into my adulthood was and is my mom. She asks me about stuff I'm writing now. She says, give me a copy of the book as soon as 
you have one and sign it for me. You know, she got me to audition for plays and helped me work out writing issues when I was a teenager. And I don't think anybody helped me be more inclined toward doing creative things than my mom. So it's her. From a professional standpoint, you are a multi-talented podcast co-host and host and a creative writer in many amazing comics. And, you know, you've done so many amazing things that we haven't had a chance to talk to in the short interview, which means you have to come back on the show and talk about your other avenues as well, too. I'd love to actually have you on for like a podcast month or something just to pick your brain that way as well, too, from one podcast host to another. We can talk shop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I do. In some ways, I think I'm more personally successful than professionally successful. <laughs> I still do comics and podcasting and all of that as, uh, I guess you'd call them side gigs. I have a day job and have had a day job most of my adult life. And then I do the creative stuff on my own time. Personally, you know, I've got an incredibly talented and beautiful wife and a great home and great family. So personally, I'm very happy. Whereas professionally, I feel like I'm still chasing something. Yeah. Personally successful. Yes. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? Actually, Imposter Syndicate sort of emerged, the the fact that it's happening now sort of emerged out of a failure. I was working on a project for pretty much two years straight, starting in 2020, like in the midst of the pandemic. And that project, through no fault of my own or anybody else's really, just kind of went away, fell apart for various reasons. Immediately after that happened, I thought, okay, now I I really need another thing to do. Eventually became, you know, this crowdfunding campaign for imposter syndicates. So I think the way I deal with failures is to find another thing to do. <laughs> the younger generation is looking at your work and becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a podcast host or a creative person in writing or comics or whatever the case may be creatively. Somehow you may be inspiring them in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think it's a pretty simple answer. Make something. Don't aspire to be a writer or a podcaster or a comic creator or whatever it is that you want to do. Do it. Even if you think you're not ready, even if you think what you make won't be good, make it anyway, and that'll be your first try. And if it's not up to your standard, then the next thing, you'll be that much closer. To being up to your standard. That's the the piece of creative advice I would give anybody. Stop wanting to do what you want to do and do it. Even if you don't know where it'll end up, write your novel. I I wrote a book. I wrote the book that became the Supervillain Handbook with no publisher, no sense that it would end up anywhere except self-published and sold to a a few dozen friends. But I did it anyway because I needed to. And then it turned into other things. Make something now, and then you can start inspiring the people who come behind you. If your life was a comic book or a podcast, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? (laughs) I think its title would be Not the Colorist, because there's a comics colorist named Matthew Wilson who is a really nice guy. I like, I can't even be mad at him. I have an extremely common first and last name. That's why I use a middle initial. And throughout my whole life, there have been other Matt Wilson's either. There was another Matt Wilson in my middle school. There've been other Matt Wilson's that I've run into in other parts of my life. And then once I got into comics, I started to go into conventions and colorist Matthew Wilson would be there and he'd be a nice guy. And people would come up to me with his books. And I'd have to say, that's not me. He's over there somewhere on my banner at conventions and in my Twitter profile and everywhere. It just says not the colorist. So people know that it's not about him. I think it would have to be called, uh, not the colorist. As far as the soundtrack, Hmm. I think the soundtrack to my life (laughs) has been like a weird mix of 90s hip hop and 2000s indie rock. So I would have to pick out specific songs, but I think it would be from those two genres throughout. Outcast has always been a big one for me. 
I've always been a big Beck and Radiohead guy. So those are some some early thoughts of what would probably be in there. I saw Beck live in at DT in in Michigan. It was a great show. But and I also saw Chumbawamba live as well too. If you want to hit see one hit wonders, that was fun. <laughs> Well, Matt, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. This has been a really great conversation. Thank you, Kurt. You're welcome. And before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you, of course? Where is your Zip campaign and anything else you'd like to promote social media-wise? You can find basically links to everything that I do at the website mattdwilson.net. That has links to the podcasts that I host, the comics that I've written, books that I've written, the non-comic books that I've written, and all my social media accounts are linked there as well. At the top of the page, at the top of that page is a link to the Zoop campaign, but you can find it at zoop.gg slash C slash imposter syndicate, imposter spelled with two O's. So it's spelled I-M-P-O-S-T-O-R, not I-M-P-O-S-T-E-R. Both are acceptable spellings, I have found, but I'm, I spelled it with the O. That's where you can find everything. I almost thought I misspelled it, to be perfectly honest, so I had to like triple check your uh, your lower third there, because I was just like, wait, two O? Oh, really? Two O's? Oh, jeez. Yeah. My Canadian brain went for a loop there for a second. <laughs> Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word, too, not the number two. Website's going through a rebuild, so that obviously takes time. But head over to the YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back. Find it at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or search any of your audio streaming service for Two Geeks Talking, and you'll find this interview and a thousand others. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.